beginning her last great journey. The Queen's farewell to Scotland and her beloved Balmoral. This morning, her coffin, draped in Scotland's royal standard, set off on its six-hour journey to Edinburgh. The route in glorious sunshine through the countryside the Queen loved so dearly, lined by crowds waiting to say their final farewells. And escorting her mother's coffin in the car behind, the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. The cortege has just come to an end with the Queen's arrival in Edinburgh. We are live in the city where the Queen is lying at rest tonight. And as the nation begins to adjust to its loss, the start of a new chapter for King Charles III. God save the King! Proclamations for the new monarch ring out in the four corners of the United Kingdom and... It's it all done! Estimate has done it! And Ryan Moore has won. We take a look back at one of the Queen's greatest loves, racing and horses. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale in Edinburgh. Good evening from Scotland's capital, Edinburgh, where Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II tonight lies at rest. Her cortege arrived here a short time ago after a six-hour journey, which began with the Queen being driven away from the home she loved most, Balmoral, for the very last time. It was an emotionally charged day, the Queen's coffin emerging into public view for the first time, bringing the country face to face, probably for the first time really, with the reality of her passing. Along the way, the poignant spectacle of thousands lining the route to pay quiet respect. The Queen's coffin will stay overnight here in the official royal residence of Holyrood House. The new King, Charles III, will travel from Buckingham Palace to Edinburgh tomorrow before what he described as his darling mama's last great journey to be reunited with his dear papa. Emma Murphy reports. After the loss, the leaving. The leaving of a queen from a castle that had granted privacy in life and in death. For a final time, Queen Elizabeth II crossed the bridge from her beloved Balmoral. The current of the Dee a sound she'd enjoyed since childhood, the only sound now. Streets were lined by those who'd lived their whole lives under her reign. This was a farewell to a woman of this country and a countrywoman at heart. Along her route, her love of rural life was honored. Tractors as well as horses an unusual yet fitting guard of honour. The untamed beauty of this area brought the late Queen great peace. Nothing has changed here, yet how very different this landscape must now seem to Princess Anne, who journeyed south with her mother's coffin. In Scotland's cities, thousands filled the streets of her kingdom to honour a life surrendered to service. A woman who pledged heart and devotion to the nation, honoured by the nation. This was a moment in history for all ages. A spectacle they will never see the likes of again. In her final Christmas message, the Queen spoke of the pain of final partings. A pain now felt by many who mourn her and all she represented. I'm very sad about this. Uh, I'll never see another Queen like her, never. Never seen her on record. 70 years she ruled her country and it was brilliant. I loved her. Being a woman and being a queen, we're not going to see that for the next three generations and it means a lot. 
Um, yeah, and she's inspirational, admired her a lot. From above, they watched as the oak coffin, draped in the royal standard of Scotland, made its way towards Edinburgh. Across the Queen's Ferry crossing, opened by the Queen, the cortege crossed the Firth of Forth to Holyrood and the waiting crowds. The Royal Mile echoed to the sound of clapping as the hearse wound its way through the city. The phones capturing the scene, a reminder of how much the world has changed during the Queen's reign. At the doors to the palace, the royal family watched as the coffin entered the courtyard. The sweet peas on top were the Queen's favourite and cut with other flowers from the Balmoral Gardens. A reminder, perhaps, of happy summer's past. This was the first stage of Queen Elizabeth's last great journey. And it was atop the shoulders of the Royal Regiment of Scotland that Queen Elizabeth's coffin was taken to rest in the throne room of Holyrood House. The Queen, so long a constant, is slowly taking her leave. Emma Murphy, ITV News, Edinburgh. Amazing pictures, aren't they? And our Royal Editor, Chris Shipp, is with me. Hello again, Chris. Now, Hi. it's a day, in a way, I mean, a remarkable day in all sorts of ways, split into two, the beginning of the late Queen's journey to her final mm. resting place, and then all about the accession of the next game. Yeah, you know, Mary, there were a couple of things that stood out for me on, on a day, of course, when there was just so much to take in. Firstly, I think, was the arrival of the coffin after it left Balmoral into Ballata. We talk about Ballata mm. a lot. This was the Queen's local village. And there have been people there who have said to us over the last couple of days, the nation has lost a monarch, but we lost a neighbour. And then, you know, there was a six hour journey. In fact, it was a little over six hours because it was running late. I was just struck by how many people just wanted to stop their cars on the side of the road to stand literally in the carriageway and see the coffin uh, go by. And there's some of the scenes there of the uh, tractors lined up in a guard of honor. There was people on bridges who were just crowded onto the bridges to see a moment of history. And you know, we've been talking, of course, about the, the passing of the late queen since Buckingham Palace announced it on Thursday. But seeing the coffin for the first time, I think for many people today, that was a reality that that's, it, is, it has happened. The, the, the era was changing. As we talk tonight, Mary, the, the coffin has been taken through the colonnade up the great stair of the Palace of Holyrood House. Uh, she is resting in the throne room. And then tomorrow, another big day for this city. And then, meanwhile, the new king is getting on with the business of ruling. He is, yes. He uh, has had a couple of audiences at Buckingham Palace today. He's met the uh, Commonwealth uh, Secretary General as well as the, the High Commissioners of the 14 Realms. Remember, he's not just the king of this country. There are 14 other realms, Canada, Australia, Belize, Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda, etc., where he is king. He has met them this afternoon. Uh, but tomorrow he has a big moment, and I think not just as king, but as son, because he will travel here to Edinburgh and he will process behind the coffin, walk up the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral uh, for that service, along with other members uh, of his family. Now, we saw the crowds on the Royal Mile today. Uh, what are they going to be like tomorrow as the coffin is taken slowly up that historic high street and into the cathedral? Mm, history happening. In front of our very eyes, isn't it? It's fascinating, Chris. Thank you for the moment. And uh, one of the first places that the Queen's cortege passed through after leaving Balmoral was the place, particularly close to our heart. Chris mentioned it just now, the village of Ballater. And there, as again, as Chris said, the people who knew her as a good neighbour, not just as a monarch. And they turned out today to pay their last respects. Sangeeta Lau was there. A display of quiet dignity for a woman so respected here. The Queen today passed through one of her favourite villages one last time. It's a place she could walk freely, protected by residents who considered her a neighbour and gathered in their thousands to mourn their shared loss. I think it was a 
great show of respect for coming through today. Um, she's much loved in this area, and um, I thought it was fitting that people came out to, to say her, pass their respects on for her. Why did you feel so passionately to be here? Um, just because she was our queen, and just really wanted to come, just to say our goodbyes. You'll look around and you'll see the photographs of her walking around the streets of Ballata and going into the butcher's shop and, and, and so on. Yeah, so she was very much uh, uh, sort of part of the furniture, really. And part of the community, visiting almost every year here in 2016 to reassure residents hit by severe flooding and let them know she was always there. Not just for official visits, though, with so many today reliving the joy of their story with her. Emily, you had a letter from the Queen. Yeah, and when my mum found out, she was like, Oh, we got a letter from the Queen! We got a letter from the Queen! <laughs> Why did you get a letter from the Queen? Because I draw her a picture of a crown. Even the simplest gesture was held in the highest regard by a monarch who always shared her time and whose wit never wavered. A story I heard was about she came across a gentleman in the village who was driving a bus and she said, well, what's, what's this? And he, and he said, it's a bus, ma'am. She said, I know it's a bus, I know it's a bus. What's it for? And he says, well, it's for taking ladies and gentlemen of a certain age to the shops. And she went, oh, oh, I, 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 I can get on that. I can do that. And uh, this gentleman who was driving the bus said, I, I don't think you can, Mum. And it was a gentleman himself who was telling me this story. And he said, well, why can I not go on? And he held up and said, but you don't have an Aberdeenshire bus pass. <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed. Moments that are just memories now, but ones that will never fade. Sangi Talal, ITV News, Balata. So much is going on at the moment. Let's just run you through a reminder of exactly what the next few days of national mourning are going to look like. And tomorrow afternoon, the Queen's coffin will process along Edinburgh's Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral. The King and some members of the Royal Family are expected to follow on foot and the coffin will rest there for 24 hours. On Tuesday evening, the coffin will leave Scotland, driven to Edinburgh Airport to be flown to RAF Northolt in northwest London before travelling by hearse to Buckingham Palace. A guard of honour will greet the procession on its arrival there. The following day, the Queen's coffin will be moved to Westminster Hall for four days of lying in state, allowing the public in the UK's capital city to pay their respects. And we are expecting thousands to come before the state funeral at Westminster Abbey on Monday the 19th of September. The service then begins at 11 a.m. Well, let's go just down the road from where I am to Holyrood, where the Queen is now lying in rest. And Neil Connery is there for us. Neil, you've been there all day. Describe the atmosphere. What's been happening? Mary, it feels like a hush has descended upon the Scottish capital tonight. I was up on the Royal Mile earlier on as the cortege made its way in and we heard and saw that wave of applause following it as it made its way down here. Some people were looking on thoughtfully, reflectively. Some had their heads bowed. Some were taking videos and pictures determined to capture history. I think after the shock of Thursday and everything that has happened over the past few days, for many people, seeing the Queen's coffin for the first time really brought home what we have lost here. But speaking to people today, there was a real determination to show gratitude for a life of incredible service. And I think what Scotland and Edinburgh has done today, will do tomorrow and on Tuesday, has been done with great dignity and reverence. The Queen's love for Scotland has been reflected back by its people. Neil Connery, thank you. Well, next, let's go to St Giles Cathedral, where, as you heard earlier, the Queen's coffin will be moved tomorrow. And uh, Louise Scott is there for us. Louise, what can we expect to see when events unroll tomorrow? Well, attention will once again return to St Giles Cathedral behind me here. And we're expecting to model scenes similar to today. People lining the streets for another opportunity to be able to see the Queen take another 
turn up the Royal Mile. After King Charles III has taken part in procedural ceremonies at the Palace of Holyrood House, he will join that procession with the Queen's Coffin back up the Royal Mile here to St Giles Cathedral, where a service of thanks and well wishes will take place at 3 p.m. and that is where the Queen will lie to rest for 24 hours, giving the public a chance to file past. We expect that to begin around 5 p.m. Later that evening at 7 o'clock, King Charles III will be joined by other members of the royal family for a vigil at the coffin known as the Vigil of Princes. And this is all giving Edinburgh and Scotland one last chance to say goodbye to the Queen. Louise Scott at St Giles Cathedral, thank you. And I don't know if you can hear, just behind me, there's a trumpeter doing the last post. I mean, it's all incredibly moving, I, I must say. And while much of the public's attention was focused on the start of the Queen's final journey, the business of the new King's accession also continued today, as I was talking to Chris about a little bit earlier. After yesterday's events in London, formal proclamations announcing Charles III as King were made in Britain's other capitals and also in Commonwealth countries. Our correspondent John Ray reports. It is ancient custom, even in an age of instant communication, that speaks with the greatest authority. God save the King! At noon across Britain and Northern Ireland, the formal proclamation of the new reign. Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign, of happy memory. Become our only lawful from Belfast to Edinburgh. Charles III. Y mae Coron Tirnas i Nedig Prydain Fawr a gogledd i Werddon. A reminder too that in its foundation the United Kingdom is a land of diverse people and languages. I ran y tywysog Charles Philip Arthur George. In Cardiff, they have not just a new king, but a new prince and princess of Wales. Three cheers for King Charles. Hip, hip. Hooray! These hip, declarations hip. came a day later than London to echo past eras when words of momentous weight were carried on horseback to all corners of the kingdom. To the days, too, when Britain had an empire that is now a commonwealth of equals. In New Zealand, the same gun salutes, the same words spoken. We duly acknowledge the ascension of our new king, His Majesty, King Charles III. And from Wellington king. to the capital of Australia. The same anthem. And another reminder of the many different traditions the British sovereign must somehow represent. From overseas realms that might seek a republican future to Britain's devolved governments that do not always pull in the same direction. For the newly proclaimed monarch in Commonwealth and Kingdom, there are big challenges ahead. John Ray, ITV News. And there were also proclamations in other British towns and cities today. Sarah Corker has more now on how communities came together. Sombre and respectful, the sound of Birmingham's brass band echoed out across the city. In Centenary Square, hundreds gathered to be part of this moment of history. The mace covered in black as a sign of respect to the Queen, as the Lord Mayor proclaimed a new king and welcomed in a new era. God save the king. God save the king. People captured this centuries-old tradition in the most modern of ways, each with their own personal memories of the Queen. Losing the Queen, it's like losing a mother because she has been the mother to the country. But I still have this memory in my heart that I saw the Queen when I was a little girl. 
and in Kenya with shoes with a hat and a, like a lovely bunches of flowers. It's really important for us to be here today because we've realised that in our children's lifetime they're never going to see a queen again. The sense of occasion wasn't lost on those at the heart of it. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, isn't it? It's, um, it doesn't happen all the time, and it's uh, such a sad event for, for the Queen's death. Glorious memory. And across the UK, communities mark this moment in their own unique ways. In Liverpool, some even brought their memories with them. In Norwich, people and their pets lined the streets. Long before rolling TV and mobile phones, this was the only way to communicate to the people that there was a new monarch. It was a military affair in Bristol and a show of support for King Charles III. He has a beautiful way with people. He knows exactly what the job is. He will carry it out seamlessly, effectively and royally. From big cities to the remotest parts of Great Britain. God save the King. In Jersey, the national anthem, so familiar and yet now suddenly so different. It was lovely being able to sing God Save the King, you know, the first time that we've sung that in public. Um, but very, very moving. And king Charles, I think, is going to be a fantastic king. I think he, I mean, he's at retirement age and now he's got a full-time job, hasn't he? <laughs> Today's pomp and ceremony ushers in a period of enormous change for all of us. Sarah Corker, ITV News. Well, King Charles had crucial business to attend to himself today as the new monarch, holding a series of important meetings at Buckingham Palace. And Chloe Keedy is there for us. Um, Chloe, tell us more about exactly what's been happening there today. Yes, Mary, Buckingham Palace is very much the office, if you like, and the new king did have important state business to attend to uh, here this afternoon. As we were hearing a little earlier from Chris, he met representatives first from the Commonwealth and then the 14 High Commissioners of the realms, uh, in other words, the countries of which he is now king. Both the Commonwealth and the realms were of huge importance to his mother, uh, the Queen. So I think these meetings this afternoon will have meant a great deal to him too. He actually left Buckingham Palace just in the last half hour and as his car drove through there were huge cheers going up uh, from the crowds. Thousands of people uh, who have been waiting here all day just hoping to catch a glimpse of their uh, new king. It was around this time yesterday he actually got out of the car and, uh, and walked around meeting people, shaking their hands. I think that's something that's very important to him. He wants to meet as many people as he can over the next few days. So yes, there will be a, a, a great number of, of state engagements that he has over the coming days, uh, but his focus will be in leading uh, the royal family and the nation in mourning. Chloe Keedy at Buckingham Palace, thank you. And uh, the sense of the royal family moving forward with vital state business, even in the midst of their grief, extended to the new Prince of Wales, Prince William, today. And our Wales reporter, Rhys Williams, joins us from Cardiff. So, Rhys, tell us more. Well, calls between the members of the royal family and politicians are by convention kept secret. However, on this occasion, with the First Minister of Wales' agreement, Kensington Palace released a joint statement today saying that in a phone call with Mark Drakeford, Prince William expressed his and the Princess of Wales' honour in being asked to serve the Welsh people and that they would do so with humility and respect. William is no stranger to Wales, of course. He's the patron of the Welsh Rugby Union. He's often seen in a Welsh rugby shirt at Wales Games. And, of course, he and his wife Catherine had their first family home on Anglesey following their wedding in 2011. But the titles Prince and Princess of Wales are divisive here. An ITV Wales, uh, an ITV Wales poll earlier this year found that fewer than half of the re respondents thought there should be another prince after Charles. And so one of their first challenges will be to prove to the sceptics their uh, relevance in modern Wales. And to that end, the statement goes on to say that the new prince and princess want to be a part of the aspirations of the Welsh people. Bruce Williams in Cardiff, thank you. 
Well, uh, let's take a, a step back now, if you like, because I'm joined by Ruth Davidson, who led, of course, the Scottish Conservatives from 2011 to 2019. And Baroness Davidson, it's been, uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a day of huge emotion, hasn't it? And it seems to have been felt particularly, and perhaps in some ways, surprisingly, by the people of Scotland. Do you know, there was three moments today that I thought had real emotional wallop. The, the last one that we've just seen was Princess Anne curtsying to her mother as the coffin went into the Palace of Holyrood House. And, and do you know, it, it really made me well up. But before that, there was an incident where uh, some farmers had given a tractor guard of honour to yes. the cortege. And, and then later at Peter Cooter, uh, there was uh, some horse riders that had done the same and brought their horses to the side of the road. And, and do you know, I, I found myself strangely emotional in a way I didn't think I was going to be. But you just see, have a sense of that the people that came out today, they just wanted to do right by the Queen. They wanted mm. to show themselves doing right to a woman that had done right by us for so long. Yeah, absolutely. And it does seem that Scotland was a very, very special place for the Queen in particular and if anyone was in any doubt what a beautiful country it is. I mean she arranged amazing weather didn't she? Fabulous sunshine today. Do you know the, the shots from the helicopter all the way down from Royal Deeside right through uh, Perthshire, Angus, Fife uh, and into Edinburgh were, were gorgeous and then and then the heavens cried for a monarch uh, you know once she was returned home to her official residence here it, you know it, it was almost fitting um, but but it wasn't synthetic that's the thing the Queen genuinely loved Scotland and, and particularly Balmoral was a place where once she got behind those gates she could be free she could be herself she could enjoy her family time she was away from the cameras she could play in goals at the football when she was a younger woman as I've heard she could go for picnics and walks and all the rest of it and 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 she loved it and and the people of Scotland you've seen thousands of them have come out to show their respect and their love for her now of course the Scots have a reputation don't they but perhaps wrongly for being rather dour and and <laughs> and, and holding the emotion in, but there did seem to be real emotion today. Yeah, but, but don't think just because we're not always as demonstrative as, as, as a people that we don't feel it deeply, because we do feel it deeply. And I think you've seen uh, in the last few days, and you'll see again tomorrow, there will be thousands on the streets tomorrow when her coffin goes up the Royal Mile into St Giles for the Lying In, and they will queue for miles to try and get in to spend time with her. That, that yeah, we might not always make a show, but we do feel it deeply. And again, perhaps inaccurately, you know, the, the view from the media bubble, some might accuse us of, is, is that the Scots don't really like the monarchy very much and, and it's all falling apart at the seams in, turn of, in terms of the United Kingdom. Yeah, do you know, there, there's a time and a place to discuss uh, politics and the Constitution, and, and this isn't it. And yes. a lot of Scots that you'll have spoken to, whether you're doing Vox Pops or whatever, will have, will have not wanted to engage in that question at all, uh, even if they might be very political in, in their own lives and at their own time. Um, but, but yes, I mean, I, I think that her service to everybody within the country, within Scotland, the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and beyond, was such that you can have huge regard for the woman and see a woman that has just given her life of service. Uh, and whatever you think of the politics of the day, you can just want to say, God bless you, ma'am. Go and be with the angels. And they certainly did today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Very nice to talk to you, Ruth. Uh, Baroness Davidson there. And... Uh, Accompanying the Queen all the way on the journey from Balmoral to Holyrood was her daughter, her only daughter, the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. You can see her here with her husband, Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence, in the car that followed immediately behind the Queen's hearse in the cortege. The Queen and Princess Anne, mother and daughter, enjoyed a really close relationship, sharing many mutual interests, not least their love of and skills with horses. A little while ago, before the death of the Queen, Princess Anne sat down with our royal editor, Chris Ship, to speak about what the examples her mother has meant to her. The ability to have somebody who is kind of epitomises what you think your country stands for has always been a, uh, a major uh, ambition. And it's a huge advantage if you have somebody who is, can be recognised as that, and not just in your country, but uh, around the world. And she had that ability throughout her reign, didn't she, really to understand what society was thinking? Yes, I, I, th I think that's a remarkable um, skill, to know what the true values are and to stick with those, not worry too much about the things, the fashions, the things that come and go, and to understand what is the bedrock of society and what makes it tick and, and people's relationships, which are fundamentally important. There have been years which have been happier than others uh, for Her Majesty the Queen and she famously referred to one particular year as her uh, Annus uh, Horribilis and um, you don't do a job for that long without challenges coming around mm -hmm. the corner 
1992 uh, for the Queen was a particular challenge on, on mm. personal levels, on, on other levels. There was a fire, there was debates about tax. There have been difficult years. Mm. And sometimes they do all happen at the same time. Um, and you never quite know when that's, when that's going to be. And personal issues with families are always difficult. And, and it doesn't matter which family that is. I don't want to dwell on difficult years unnecessarily, but one can't talk about the Queen's reign without referring to 1997 and the particular challenges that she faced as a grandmother, as a mother-in-law. There were criticisms of the way in which that week unfolded, perhaps unfairly, but August 1997 and the death of the Diana Princess of Wales was a real challenge, wasn't it? Yes. I think my mother did exactly the right thing. I think it's absolutely extraordinary that any right-minded thinking parent should believe that it was the, would have been an alternative to bring those children down here to London in all that hoo-ha. I just don't know how you could think that that would have been a better thing to do. And that was a case of her putting her grandchildren first Absolutely. and their needs first. Absolutely. And I don't think either of those two could have been able to cope. They'd been anywhere else. And that was the only good thing that happened, was that they were there. And they had that structure, they had people around them who could understand and let them give them the time. Happier times. Not long after the incident we just uh, spoke of, there was the uh, anniversary of the, the, the Queen and the Duke on, in the November. And that was the point at which your mother referred to her father as her strength and stay. Mm. Um, suddenly she was able to tell the nation, I think, that actually how much he had meant to her mm. over that period of time. That kind of sense of partnership was really important. I suspect there was, it was a very much... This complemented each other's strengths and skills. And that continued to be true right way through their, their marriage. My final question on Her Majesty um, is the way in which she's left the institution of monarchy in a very good shape for her successor. Uh, yes, and I think I would go back to my um, comment about belief in values of behaviour towards each other. That doesn't change, and I think that's her, what her life has, has shown. And if that's the, if that's the example that um, people find that gives them the confidence for the future, um, then that's, I'm sure, an encouragement to all of us. But there's no doubt that her example has been absolutely key in that. Princess Royal, Princess Anne speaking to our royal editor, Chris Ship, some weeks ago there. Now, as we said, one of the Queen's greatest passions was for horses. An accomplished rider herself, she was also a widely respected racehorse owner. Today, the sport resumed after its pause immediately following the Queen's death. Uh, silence was observed at Doncaster Racecourse out of the St Ledger. The flat racing season's final classic followed by the national anthem. It was a race she herself won in her Silver Jubilee year of 1977 with a filly named Dunfermline. Her achievements in racing also saw her enter the winner's enclosure at Royal Ascot a remarkable 23 times, as Garen Vincent explains. Estimate might just strike the front. Racing may be the sport of kings, but throughout her life it was the sport of our queen. A royal win in the Gold Cup! Estimate has done it! Estimate and Ryan Moore has won for Her Majesty the Queen! And on a day out at Royal Ascot, if one of her horses came in, she found it very difficult to hide her delight. But it's all about estimate here. She was very tense and she grabbed my arm and just when we hit the front she said, I've done it. And of course, um, it was one of the great moments. Everybody in the Royal Box was so excited for her. She just rushed down to the paddock and all she really wanted to do was touch the horse again. She really, really loved her horses. It was an incredibly emotional time. Come on, Daddy! The Queen's passion for horses was sparked right at the very start of her life. 
If responsibilities of higher state seem far removed on this brisk morning, they are nevertheless a very near prospect. She grew into a fine horsewoman with a growing interest in thoroughbred races. It was always part of her. She always knew her, her horses. They were part of the family. Her father, King George VI, had an Oaks winner called Sun Chariot, it was a brilliant mare. And the Queen went to see the filly at Beckhampton and stroked its beautiful, soft, satiny skin. And she always was supposed to have refused to wash her hand for two days because it was such a lovely feel. It was here at the Royal Stud at Sandringham that the Queen indulged that interest and produced her fair share of winners. There's one of him going up now. Her first, Monovine, delighted a princess in the stand at Hurst Park in 1950. As he went on to increase his lead and bring off a clear-cut victory by six lengths, the princess's delight was no longer in doubt. Another of her big stars was Oriole, seen here at the Coronation Derby in 1953. What she used to love to do was come to the yard. I mean, that was her day out. She would wander through the barns and talk to all the lads and, and, um, and totally enjoy it. It's a shame, really, that uh, she couldn't come racing more often than she did, really. So what we tried to do, or tried to do, was get runners for at Ascot. Horses, of course, also played a role in the ceremony of the Queen's public life, most often at Trooping the Colour. Her horsemanship and her composure were put to the test in 1981 when someone in the crowd fired blank shots at her. Her Majesty didn't flinch. Private moments could be glimpsed at Sandringham, out riding with a groom or driving herself back and forth to the stables. This was her escape. Horses were an escape because something she could do physically go right on in her 90s she was, she was riding. But also, without being trite about it, they didn't talk. You know, everybody wants to talk to the Queen or dare talk to the Queen. The horse is going to be the same whether it's the Queen or you or me. Horses were the Queen's great hobby. Racing and breeding these beautiful animals gave her a huge amount of pleasure. And they drew out aspects of her character, the attention to detail, the consideration for others, and the ability not to get too carried away with either the good times or the bad that defined so many parts of her life and reign. And coming away, free agent, it's a royal winner. Such was the Queen's devotion to public duty, the pleasures that she enjoyed in the few hours of spare time she allowed herself were very rarely seen. Horses were her most precious pastime. She couldn't have done without her racing, and racing will certainly miss her. Geraint Vincent, ITV News. Well, let's go back now to Chris Ship for a final thought about today's uh, momentous events and also uh, looking ahead to tomorrow. But today, first of all, we saw the first hint, didn't we? The first sight of the meticulously planned, very carefully executed official pomp and circumstance. We did, and of course you can plan things but just because you've planned them and a lot of it was signed off by the Queen herself it, you know all these details were run past her and she gave them her approval but it doesn't take away from the poignancy of some of those little details you know even before we saw the coffin at Balmoral today there were six gamekeepers from her Balmoral estate who carried it from the throne room uh, into the hearse and then we were told the flowers on the coffin dahlia sweet peas the Queen's uh, favorite um, um, among with you know white heather all picked from her estate little details like that and I think we can see again the images of those horses that are all lined up it was in a place called uh, Peter Kuta just on the outside of Aberdeen and they can see there them in are, the look. bottom of the left hand corner of the screen there I counted a dozen horses I mean how touching was that and all of this was quite instinctive everyone had come out of their you know houses or their places of work because they wanted to be part of the moment and of course this is just the start because there's tomorrow, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and then there's obviously the, 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 the move to London and everything that's going to happen there. All right, well, Chris, thank you very much indeed. There is so much still to come. It is uh, fascinating and moving, isn't it, in equal measure, I think. Well, tonight, uh, the Queen's coffin lies in rest at the Palace of Holyrood House behind me, enveloped in the Royal Standard of Scotland and guarded by the Royal Company of Archers. Now, even though the crowds packed the Royal Mile in Edinburgh ten deep, 
as Her Late Majesty's cortege ended its six-hour journey, there was sombre silence as soldiers from the Royal Regiment of Scotland carried the Queen's coffin into the palace under the watchful eyes of her children and their spouses. Now, the journey had begun this morning with the intensely poignant moment of the Queen's final exit from Balmoral through those gates. And it continued with people lining the route all the way in glorious sunshine. And as the nation took in the enormity of its loss, there were more proclamation ceremonies around the UK, connecting the new King Charles III to all four corners of his kingdom. Meanwhile, at Buckingham Palace, at Windsor and all around the country, people in their thousands upon thousands came forward to lay their own tributes to the Queen. Well, that is all from us for now. Tom will be back with news at 10, but from me in Edinburgh, all the team here on another day will live long in the nation's memory. Goodbye.